Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll begin with Kennedy's question, the second part. He says, difference between election and predestination. So election is to state that one is chosen. We as God's people are chosen. We will read now in uh, First Peter chapter 2, there is this section where he says, you are a uh, chosen generation, right? So uh, we are chosen or we are handpicked by God just to indicate that we are special towards God. Predestination is predetermining uh, or because it says destination, the destiny of individuals, what they are going to do and you know uh, what they are going to be. So predetermining is predestination. Okay. So election is being chosen. Predestination is predetermining. Uh, and he has been chosen us as a bond servant of God. So bond servant of God, uh, actually, I think it comes from this word, Greek word doulos. Doulos where they would have uh, slaves who were who were in service to the master um like whole like committed 100 percent. so those slaves were uh, sold to the master so committed to the master so when we say chosen as a bond servant it simply means we know uh, apostles they they had used this term to state their allegiance to god and the lord jesus and their commitment to the cause uh, of living for Christ. So that is the understanding of bond servant. Now, having said these things, chosen and predestined, see, predestination should be understood uh, in terms of the attributes of God. Omniscience is one of the attributes of God. So God already knows. Though the term predestination is used, it doesn't mean God... Uh, he determines people's future because if that was the case even adam and eve being given free choice today we have free choice salvation is by choice so uh, free will and choice is a very real thing that god has given not just for mankind but we also know even the heavenly hosts angelic beings everyone they have free choice and uh, that is not something God ever overrides. Okay, so though that is this term predestination, there's enough in scripture to tell us that God doesn't force people into a certain direction for their spiritual lives or lives in general. Um, so yeah, that much, uh, Kennedy. I hope uh, that is helpful. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Okay, let's now move ahead uh, with uh, First Peter chapter 2. So we'll notice some doctrine here as right now we've started talking about Jesus because he's again pointing to Jesus as an example. Jesus, he came and he died for us. And because of that, we are chosen, we are precious. That's, that's how he encouraged the believers. And now he's talking about Jesus as one who was rejected and yet you know, the precious one uh, to our God. And similarly, we are also chosen uh, by God and we are precious, even though the believers were going through rejection at that time and feeling the pain of it. Uh, he wanted them to experience joy. So let's read from verse 6 and uh, we shall read till... Yeah, let's read till 10. 6 to 10, please. Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures, Before I lay in Zion, the chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will, be, will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the, uh, the stone that which the uh, builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, 
to which they are also appointed. But you are, cho uh, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, ro a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have ob obtained mercy. Thank you, Kung. Uh, and as we can see here, uh, he is using the example of Jesus to encourage the rejected believers. And he's saying, think about Jesus. You know, he was, um, he, I stated that he is uh, referred to as a stone, uh, chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He's chosen by God, even though he was rejected by men, he was chosen by God. And so he says that now that we put our trust in this Lord Jesus, the cornerstone. We will not be put to shame. Okay. Uh, and similarly, he goes on, like he goes on to talk about the believers. And he says that, you know, don't think of yourselves as rejected because you are chosen by God. The way Jesus, the cornerstone, was chosen by God, rejected by men. You are chosen by God. And he uses terms like chosen generation. What does it mean? It simply means that God, uh, God has chosen to reveal His glory, right, through the believers. So, um, literally, we know that Israel was the one that was chosen. But through Israel, what was God's plan that the nations of the earth should be blessed, that the gospel should go out to the nations of the world. So it's not saying that you know God has limited His uh, His selection to a bunch of people and that's about it even on the day of pentecost when the holy spirit was poured out 15 different languages people spoke because the gospel needs to be proclaimed to all of mankind that's god's desire so let not this word chosen uh misguide or mislead us into thinking that god is partial or he's very selective but those who respond to god we become the chosen so we are chosen by god royal priesthood so again look at, looking at the old testament we see that royalty was generally separate from uh, priestly ministry so you had priests in the temple but then you had kings both of these would not be mixed up there were two dip different anointings but now that the lord jesus has come and he has redeemed us this this combination royal priesthood is very unique to the believers we are both royal we are royalty in the sight of god and uh, we also have priesthood we have direct access to god we can offer up spiritual sacrifices unto the lord and so he's reminding the people that you have all this in christ jesus he says holy nation okay uh, you are a sanctified people god has shed his own blood to cleanse you his own special people special is to say that we belong to god now we are in the kingdom of our lord jesus christ and what is the goal or the outcome of these people whom he has described with so many words and initially he also called them living stones right living stones because god is building his kingdom his house with each one of you and he says the outcome is that you may proclaim the praises of him so this is the call of every believer. Why do I, what should I do for God? What am I supposed to do? It's very clear. Proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that is what each one of us is called to do through each of our lives. May the Lord be glorified. And that's what he's telling the believers of that time. May God be glorified through your life because he has purchased you he has made you new you now belong to a new kingdom the kingdom of a god's marvelous light and he also reminds them look the past was very different you were not even a people or uh, in in as far as the kingdom of god is concerned right they did not have any identity but now they have an identity they've obtained the mercy of god through what jesus has done and he wants them to recognize that and now 
again starts instructions for righteous living, uh, one of which has to do with submission. So we'll see. He'll talk a lot about submission. He'll talk about submission to authorities, submission to um, people that we work for, submission in the context of marriage. He'll talk about submission of the wives to the husbands. And then uh, he'll also go on to talking about the context of the church uh, and uh, that the, the overseers of the church or the shepherds have to uh, oversee the, the people of God because they are in you know subjection or submission to the elders of the church so there's be different instructions regarding submission coming up so we are beginning with an instruction for holy living as he did earlier so he says look if we put it in simple terms he's encouraging the believers reminding them of what they have in christ how the life that the challenges we have are temporal there's eternal glory waiting for us and so to hold on and for faith to reflect in our actions, just the way James spoke to the believers. He says, look, you're saying you have a new life in Christ. Let it show through your life. Let it be a righteous life. Let it be a holy life. So going to uh, verse 11, can somebody please read from 11 all the way to the end of chapter 2, which would be was uh, what is that? 25 please yeah dearly beloved i beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evil doers they may by your good works which they shall behold Glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of malicious, maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the fro forward. For this is thanksworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that is acceptable with God. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was re reviled, Reviled not again when he suffered. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for, for reading that. Um, we will look at some of the key instructions that are coming through here. As I said, there is an instruction for godly living. Uh, and he reminds us, he says, so Jonas and pilgrims, the intention is to tell the believer, uh, life on earth is temporary. Remember that. Our citizenship is in heaven. So sojourners and pilgrims, we are just journeying through. Uh, nothing is permanent here. And he says, when we are, we actually belong to a heavenly kingdom, uh, we must, we must seem that we've come from that heavenly kingdom and have features of that heavenly kingdom. And, you know, uh, we have got to be different in other words. And that's why 
earlier he said be holy and now again along the same lines he's saying abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul okay another beautiful deep concept we can go into is how when we yield to fleshly lusts there is that deceptive thought that we are going to receive gratification or satisfaction from fleshly lust because that's how it appears if you get into it and you get more of it you're going to feel wonderful but it's deceptive because why uh, here peter is pointing out fleshly lust what do they do god has designed our soul in a certain way but fleshly less lusts are uh, are going to go against that design and they are going to bring destruction to the soul so no man who engages in fleshly lust can maintain the peace of god you know within him or her uh, uh, because there is something opposite right about fleshly lust which is going to destroy the soul that god has given us so he's saying stay out of these things we have a different life now we can't live like the people of the world and go after the things that they are going after you are sojourners and pilgrims we have an eternal abode and our mind should be fixed on that so he says having your conduct honorable among the gentiles uh, that when they speak against you as evil doers they may by your good works which they observe glorify god in the day of visitation so just the way jesus taught us right good works let people glorify god because of your good works so when we say believers hopefully the uh, you know the unbelievers look at it as you know an upgrade or uh, in moral living where, where they say oh this person believes in jesus look at him he's so righteous look at him he'll never lie look at him he'll never cheat you know look at him he'll never do anything uh, 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 he won't deal wrongly with money hopefully that is our testimony okay so that's what he's reminding the believer when we say we have faith let it translate in our life and testimony because that is how it should be that life is actually flowing out of us so, and he is giving the believers this instruction during a difficult time and in preparation for worse times to come and you can imagine like peter what are you talking times are getting tough everyone is fending for themselves everyone is fighting for themselves to establish themselves uh, in the in the world and get more and all that and you're telling us keep a good testimony follow god be holy but then what what he wants us to realize is look this world is not everything for us there are greater things in god in the spiritual realm uh, in the uh, you know at the time of the appearance of our lord jesus so a believer must have that eternal mindset only then we will know the value of what peter is telling us right live a holy life times are difficult but you still make the right choices you still maintain the good testimony okay so that is the call that he is bringing uh, uh, giving the believer and then two more sections here which we noticed where he says submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the lord's sake and he lists out king as supreme governors to those sent by him for the punishment of evil doers for the praise of those who do good okay so what do we understand here governing authorities today some of us may have kings in our nation some of us don't but governing authorities he says you be in submission to them or you go by you know the the uh, the laws that they have kept and the way in which they are guiding uh, the nation okay. so what is the responsibility of governing authorities two things punishment of evil doers praise of those who do good so they are like a like a picture or a shadow of god because god is a god of justice and uh, he he wants to um, uphold justice on the earth and so like him there's a reflection you have authorities you have people put in places of power who are supposed to do that uphold justice so he say that's their role so you be in submission to them for this is the will of god that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for wise but as born servants of god so he knows that during the time of persecution the believers can get rebellious right and they may say uh, um, why should we keep the law 
of the land why should we follow our governing authorities and they can end up having you know uh, like the testimony among the people will also be spoiled now one thing we have to understand whenever we talk about submission if the governing authorities ask us to do something against uh, god that we cannot follow but everything else yes you know we can go uh, according to it when we read the book of acts when we study about the life of paul he he was under trial and what were they trying to look for you know that uh, he um, defamed the roman authorities and uh, he did his own thing he broke the law but they could never find one thing against paul because they were law abiding citizens though we have instances for example in acts 4 we have a time when uh, peter and john and this is the same peter who says oh we can't do it don't preach in the name of jesus he says sorry we can't do it so when the governing authorities are telling us to do something against god like you know times of shadrach meshach abednego they were thrown into the fire because they were not willing to uh, bow down to an idol and worship it so don't uh, you know go with the law if it's asking you to go against god that even peter knows but everything apart from that he saying christians believers we've got to be the most law abiding citizens you know uh, actually so that's how it should be because then what happens people will look at us and see how we he writes here honor all people love the brotherhood fear god honor the king you know we are living our life in a very very righteous way and that should be the testimony of every believer even in times of difficult persecution okay so that's the call which is going out to the believers and next section he talks about submitting submitting to masters uh, masters is a strong word and in their times uh, there were slaves and masters but today not so we we have bosses we have employers so we can understand it in that context so in the workplace he says you be submissive to the person who is your authority at the workplace with all fear what fear fear is reverence here reverence uh, reverence toward god ultimately our following of authority keeping the law uh, you know being being a good employee is because ultimately we fear god right and and that's why we are doing it and a very hard thing that he speaks of over here is he says look when it comes to bosses when it comes to uh, you know superiors some of them are gentle thank god for that some of them are good they are understanding excellent you know then the problem is solved uh, right in many ways but some of them are so harsh uh, but then he says even when we have harsh people in authority over us he says what is what how good is it if you are only submissive to those who are gentle but he uses the word commendable uh if we endure unjust grief suffering and you know uh, uh things that are done wrongfully to us we endure it and still maintain a good attitude towards our boss or our employer so that is something you know uh it could happen in in the places where we work we don't have the most supportive uh employer but as christian as a believer as long as they're not telling us to do anything against god we must be those who are doing the right thing always right and uh, he goes ahead and then says that god commends it or god is pleased with it he's happy with it uh, and he asks this question for what credit it is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently because one deserves it if they've done wrong but when you do good and suffer if you take it patiently this is commendable before god so a very hard call there he says be uh, submissive not just to your good master but also in case they are you know harsh uh, you still got to be submissive to them okay then he points to the example of jesus once again because that's a perfect example and he says a uh, christ also suffered for us leaving us an 
example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth so he's telling us see we go through some of these seasons where unjustly we are treated uh, you know in an evil way but it's not a new experience uh, for jesus he also went through it he did nothing but he still suffered right but because he trusted god and he trusted god for the ultimate outcome you know there are so many other examples we can look at uh, stories like esther the book of esther where there was a plot against the jews uh, and you know it was so difficult to to uh, turn the rules and the laws in favor of the jews there were people who were actually scheming and uh, planning to destroy the jews but you see when they put their trust in god you find esther and the people they fast they look to the lord so how did the solution come they look to the lord and then ultimately that whole thing happens you know the gallows that is built for mordecai is finally haman is the one who dies on it so there are instances in scripture where we see god coming through so powerfully on behalf of his people because they have put their trust in god are they going through injustice yes is this unfair yes but uh peter is saying don't get hassled god will come through for you so you do the right thing right look at jesus he committed no sin but uh he went through suffering and then he talks more about jesus so again you know doctrine uh, like the book of hebrews we can keep on talking about uh, these passages who when he was reviled did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously see there a good attitude he had a good attitude even during suffering because of what we fear god that's why we do this okay because he him who judges righteously he committed himself to god who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness okay so here the righteousness of god we are now um, the righteousness of god in christ jesus right when we read uh, i think it's romans 5:21 uh, so we can learn so much about the righteousness that has now been uh, bestowed upon us and we we see the work of the cross right isaiah 53 by whose stripes you were healed why does he say were healed we were talking about past tense present tense well on the day or in those moments when jesus died on the cross as far as peter is concerned and he is one of those disciples who was who was there he even denied christ but he knew of a spiritual reality and that is the great exchange took place in those moments when jesus died on the cross and that's why he's using the past tense here and it's not a grammatical mistake it it is in the greek also it is were he's using it in the past because it's done it's a done deal our healing was bought for us on the cross of calvary 2000 years ago we were healed so if i confess and i make a declaration i was healed by the stripes of jesus it's it's uh, doctrinally biblically very accurate then it says for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul so he says we are now in subjection to god and thereby uh, being uh, subject to authorities whom god has uh, put on our lives whether it is a king or whether it is a boss uh, it's fine you know we can do it because we trust god Okay, so let me just come here and see if there are any questions uh, before we move into chapter three. Yeah, any any thoughts? Any questions? It's quite straightforward. Okay, now let's move on to chapter three here, and the submission. of wives that is being spoken of uh, and wives are being encouraged mm, would somebody uh, like to read it you can read from verse 1 and let's read yeah let's read till verse 6 so that's one section let's go over that 1 to 6 1 to 6 it reads yes in the same way you wives must accept the authority of your husband and even if some refuse to obey the good news your godly lives will speak to them without any words 
they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are our daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Yes, thank you, Say. So this is in the context of uh, women getting saved once they are married. And now that they are saved, they are believers, but their husbands are still unbelievers. So how to deal with this situation? We see Paul addressing this uh, uh, to the Corinthian church. Okay? Uh, even in the book of Ephesians, you know, Paul talks about the mystery um, of uh, the way God deals with the church. And then he uh, uses the example of marriage there and says, husbands, love your wives. Uh, right? And, and so uh, this matter, this issue was happening during those times. And women were probably perplexed about what needs to be done now because I'm a believer and he's not a believer. So even in such a situation, here, uh, of course, Paul addresses that and he says that if the person wants to live with you, then you just stay with that person. But if that person abandons you, then, you know, then that's fine. What can you do? Uh, but if the person chooses to stay, so it, over here, there are women and their husbands are staying with them. They've chosen to stay with them. Uh, maybe, maybe what happened to them is now that they understand uh, about the great um, blessings in Christ, there is a tendency to look down upon the unbeliever. Okay, And in this case, it's a husband that they are married to. But Peter reminds them that it's still the context of marriage and uh, the government uh, structure in marriage is, is what uh, you know God has uh, prescribed. And he says, it's God, the husband, and then the wife. Okay, So that is the government. Uh, structure as far as the family is concerned. So he is reiterating that. Peter is reiterating that and he says, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands. And notice he says to your own husbands because there are, you know, lots of schools of thought and theological arguments about how um, in general women have to be subject to men in general, right? Like all women be submissive to all men. But Peter is clarifying here. He's saying, look, that's that's not how it is. He says, um, uh, I, I mean, there, there are so many scriptures we can go into, but I'm trying not to go into those things. He says, be submissive to your own husbands. So this is in the context of marriage. Then that even if uh, some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So he's saying, even in the case of somebody who is, uh, you know, so far away from God, they, they don't obey the word. And the words that you say, uh, he's saying that there is a way of winning such a husband over, and that is by the life and conduct uh, that one has. Right. Uh, and living a life of reverence. That's the word fear there. Um, and he says even without a word. So when we have this kind of a conduct in the context of marriage, right, in the context of marriage, uh, then God will do a work in the husband's life. And he I mean, it's a tall claim. He says even without a word. So uh, there's no need to keep instructing, keep, uh, uh, you know, pointing to what needs to be done or just going on, uh, you know, nagging the, the husband. But he says, look, if you live a life of this kind, even without a word, the husband can be won over. Uh, but, you know, we must understand that over here, this has not happened because somebody has chosen to marry an unbeliever. But when women got saved, 
and they were already in these marriages, Peter's giving them this instruction. Don't worry. You follow God and your husband will be one over. And then he continues. He says, so the emphasis is on that God-fearing behavior, conduct okay, before the husband. So in that context, with that emphasis, he says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So he's saying that through this good conduct, uh, the husbands can be won over, not really uh, through external things. And he has listed them out, right? Like your appearance and the way one uh, dresses up and all that. Um, so that's understood. But then again, when this is misinterpreted, people come up with uh, things such as uh, women should not adorn themselves. You know, you, uh, hair and jewelry is wrong uh, and all. But that's definitely not the point that Peter is making. Okay, so if you go back and look at, um, okay, I'll come to that. You look at women, old women, and here there's a reference to Sarah. Okay, uh, when you see Sarah, you know, going to be with Abraham, uh, she was given jewelry. So why is Sarah being commended as a godly woman when she wore jewelry? You look at people like Rebecca; they wore jewelry. So we must not misinterpret what the focus of what is being said here, uh, the emphasis is godly conduct. When we have godly conduct, uh, when uh, such a wife is submissive to her husband, there is this possibility of that uh, unbelieving husband being won over. So verse 5 says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Okay, so we are going to talk about Sarah here. So Sarah was submissive to Abraham as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So uh, she was submissive to Abraham and calling him Lord is more like honor. So she honored her husband. She was submissive to her husband. And there is an example uh, of Sarah that we can draw from in the context of marriage. OK, so any thoughts and questions before we uh, jump to the next section here? Instruction to husbands. Um, hello, Pastor Nancy. So um, yes. how do you, I, I, I think I get the context of this, but for some women in our contemporary times now, how do you let them understand that? Uh, or rather, let me put it this way. Some of them may object to the fact of calling their husband's Lord. Mm. <laughs> so how do we explain this to them in a way that um, they understand that this is cultural pertaining to the Jewish people, but at the same time, as a wife, you should regard mm. your husband, mm. uh, you should accord him respect, basically. I think that is the the <laughs> gist of this verse. But some people might just see it and take it um, on the surface and try to compel their wives to call them Lord. Mm. So can, can we just address this? Uh, yes. Uh, so we would need to take the essence of it, uh, say, and uh, that is, Honor your husbands. That's what it says. So when Sarah called him Lord, it simply means she honored her husband. So women are being encouraged to honor their husbands. Uh, and, and that can come as an exhortation. Um, that can come as a you know gentle exhortation to them to honor their husbands. Uh, now, why doesn't it happen in marriages? There are so many you know different uh, reasons for that. Uh, but as we continue ahead, right, in his instruction to the husband, uh, there there is something good that you you can learn. And if a husband would behave in in uh, the way that Peter is instructing, um, hopefully, you know, the the reaction and response of the wife will be one of honor. So you see, uh, yeah. So can I go into the next section? So then that will help you. 
Oh no, it's a, I, 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 I was just asking so to kind of because you know sometimes you could read these passages and because they say oh it's in the Bible, then the wives must call me Lord. So I just wanted to bring that up so that uh, for essence of discussion, I don't know if you get what I'm saying because I it's got, in the Bible. I, some people yes. feel like because it's in the Bible, then they yes. have every right to demand of their wives to call them Lord. Yes, but I think you just brought out the the answer is the essence that we should look at here. Exactly. And that's honor and respect. Yes. Yeah, and people who want to take uh, these matters, um, you know, uh, on the surface level, they understand it and they take it. A lot of that is already happening, and it's very unfortunate. They they keep doing that. Yes, so, that's very sad. <laughs> but that, that's not what it means. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, Sister Rupa. Ma'am, I just wanted to add, mm. honor is something which is deep within inside. Uh, just because we call somebody Lord doesn't mean that we honor them. That is what the point the the Peter is Peter is making there. Sarah was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in that time. And at the same time, the Spirit of God is point out, pointing out to us that her heart, the deep within her, she has a wonderful quality which God desires and honors. So no one, many times people put down Sarah, but uh, the Spirit of God is saying that she has a very beautiful nature deep within her, which uh, God is honoring. And not only that, the life she went through, with Abraham, twice she was he lied to the people there because he was very afraid because she was so beautiful, and he had to say she is she was her, his sister. But both times when it when things like that happen, naturally women will have a contempt of or a deep uh, hurt towards their husband because husband is one who has to protect them. But has, uh, Sarah, Abraham tells Sarah, even before they start their journey, because you're very beautiful, please, wherever we go, I'll tell them that you are my sister. So that understanding, their love for each other and their oneness is something which is very uh, noticeable there. She loved her husband and because of her love, she was willing to do that. But because of her faith, God was so faithful that she delivered, he delivered her in those situations. In that context, when Sarah is calling her husband Lord, it makes a sense, a greater uh, meaning. Because when people, we are all people, we are sinful people, we don't, uh, everyone has their own weaknesses. But... We, in spite of that, in the Lord, we are honoring the other person. We are loving the other person. That is what the writer is trying to bring, bring out, I think. Ma'am, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, very true, sister. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all these thoughts. That's right. Uh, yes, in the midst of um, uh, all the flaws that both husbands and wives have, the writer is still trying to tell them that this is the way in which they need to relate with one another. And I, I think uh, the underlying um, truth, which has not been mentioned, but it, it is understood as love. When there is love, like First Corinthians 13, that, that kind of love, uh, then all these things are possible. Okay. Uh, so thank you, sister. Thank you so much for sharing that. We will uh, look at the instructions to the husbands, and then we will uh, wrap up for today. So could uh, someone kindly read um, verse 7 here? In an understanding way, showing honor to the Lord as the weaker also, since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Asha. So uh, uh, as we see here, we 
notice that there is an instruction to husbands as well. Okay. Uh, now, it could be the same context where there is a spouse and you know they they don't believe in God, but then he says, dwell with them or don't leave the person. So earlier he did uh, talk to the wife. Uh, but now he's talking to the husbands and he says, you dwell with them. Don't just leave and go. Dwell with them with understanding. So not just being there like physically present, but there's a very key, uh, you know, word for marriage here. And that word is understanding. Like even when you go to the book of Proverbs, it says that the house is built with understanding. So if there is no understanding, then uh, it's very difficult, like. Right? right in a uh, marriage but he is pointing to the importance of developing that understanding he says dwell with the wife with understanding so grow in understanding understanding each other and another thing that he tells the husbands is giving honor yes he told the wife be submissive uh, sarah called her husband lord meaning he she honored her husband now he's telling the husband as well honor the wife giving honor to the wife see these are the important things so when the husband has this attitude uh, it becomes a lot easier for the wife to be submissive and uh, you know to uh, honor the husband now yes even if the husbands are not that's what peter said that they need to hold on trust god and eventually uh, you know the husband will change but if the husband is like this then it becomes so much easier for the wife a uh, husband who dwells with understanding gives honor to his wife and it says as a weaker vessel how weaker in the biblical uh, texts when we read we don't necessarily see that the woman is weak um spiritually okay because right in this passage he says being heirs together or they are co-heirs we have the same inheritance spiritually in christ so we're not weak women are not weaker than men spiritually in that sense uh, even emotionally we don't see that women are you know weaker than men emotionally so he's not referring to that but yes physically if you compare uh, the kind of things that men can do the strength which they have maybe women may not be able to demonstrate that form of uh, physical strength so in that context he says weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered and he puts a warning there and it's a spiritual warning he says look if you don't do this for your wife then it will affect you spiritually what might happen prayers can also be hindered if a husband is not uh, dealing in the right manner with his wife okay so hopefully according to peter that was some motivation uh, for the husbands that you want to be a spiritual man you better treat your wife well right better treat your wife right uh, so um, that is the instruction to men so let's close because i know you have another class and what we'll do is we'll have our next class on friday let's see how much we can complete yeah but we will be done uh, in time so could somebody kindly pray as we close today's class Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we acknowledge your holy name. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to learn and grow together, Father. Thank you for this subject. Thank you for the life of past Nancy as we keep on growing and learning from the book of Peter. Father, thank you for your wonderful insights and deep revelations. I thank you for this wonderful opportunity again and I dedicate each and everyone. Uh, to be the future kingdom soldiers father thank you so much for this um beautiful atmosphere and learning opportunity i give all glory and honor to your name only i ask this prayer in the name of our lord jesus christ amen amen, amen. thank you prabhakar thank you everyone god bless you i look forward to meeting you on friday bye for now thank you pastor thank you pastor Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor.